A 500mg DMT trip report, sent in by a subscriber. As I write this, I am 26 years old. I am currently sober from everything, as I am an addict and alcoholic. I admit this freely, and feel no shame about it. I do not find I can use drugs or alcohol, or even psychedelics in a way that is conducive or productive. This may change in time, but I am not in a rush to experiment again. Feel free to share this or not. At the time of the trip report, I was age 19. I will go by M. This experience was my very first ever experience of DMT. It holds a very special place in my heart, while also being difficult to contextualise and integrate. This is my first time writing this at length, so I'll ask you to bear with me. I was 19 years old at the time, when the year was 2016. 2016 was a year of extreme highs and extreme lows for me. I just received my first criminal charges for a DUI, where I hit another driver while off my face on vodka and crack cocaine, and had lost my license for two years. This will be somewhat relevant to the story later on. I was quite lost at this point in my life. I lived with roommates in an apartment, and I was pretty poor. I had just started a new job, my first ever job in an office, that I was beginning to despise with every fibre of my being. I was still young and hopeful. Yet I felt at odds with myself and my circumstances, and felt I had a very long ways to go to change things. I really didn't know who I was at this point in my life, and my identity, ego, and self-worth was all tied up in the opinions of others and what I had. I knew even at the time that I had the wrong way of looking at things, but I didn't know how to change. I was still growing up and learning about myself, and still am, like everyone else. But I did think I was a bit special or different, these misunderstandings would soon be crushed by the power of DMT. My experience with drugs at the time was quite a bit. Weed, nitrous, LSD, PCP, DXM, mushrooms, cocaine, crack cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, various M-bombs, ketamine, MDMA, MDA, mescaline, too many narcotic pharmaceuticals to name, but mostly opioids and benzodiazepines as far as pharmaceuticals went. There are probably many more I'm forgetting, but it really doesn't matter. I was also a blossoming IV user at the time. Not actively during the months surrounding the approximate date of this first DMT trip, but before and after. Moving up to the trip itself, I mentioned that I had just started a new job. During the training and orientation for the new job, I made a friend. We will refer to him as F. F was a hippie type, and I wanted to think that I was too. But looking back on things, I wasn't really. It's not important, but the only thing we really had in common was a massive interest in the Grateful Dead and taking psychedelics. I got to finding out pretty quickly in my conversations with F that he was the man to find if you were looking for high quality classic psychedelics. I had never met a strictly psychedelic connect at this point, especially with different options. I usually only knew someone who could only get LSD or only get mushrooms. We quickly became friends, or he saw another potential buyer. Either way, we like each other and spent time together and talked often. I would say it was maybe two weeks into knowing him that he revealed that he could supply me with DMT. He explained that it was synthesised and extracted from acacia confuser bark, which at the time I had no idea what that even meant. He explained that it was some of the most potent DMT he had ever sourced, and that it would absolutely blow my mind to smithereens. Perfect, I thought. Exactly what I need. I had researched DMT at length many times leading up to this, and had friends in the past that told me about it. One of the most true statements one of my friends told me about DMT years prior to this was that whatever you think it's going to be like, it's not that. So, a simple deal was made. F said one gram would be a hundred dollars. It said that it did not sell less than one gram at a time which in retrospect was a bit shady, but in my 19 year old brain, that was great, because I'd have more for the next time. Little did I know how hesitant I would be to smoke it again after this though. He said he would come by after work and drop it off at my apartment, as he didn't have it with him. I agreed and stopped off at an ATM on my way home from work to withdraw the cash. A few hours later, he arrived. I handed him the money and he handed me one gram of DMT. I ran back inside to look at it, smell it, and figure out the best way to smoke it. In all of my excitement, 
I realised I really did not know how to smoke it on my own. I also didn't want to disclose to my roommates at the time what I was about to embark upon. None of them were tripping people, and I had intended to be alone my first time smoking anyway, as it's recommended, and I did not have anyone I deeply trusted in that way. In my doubts, I sent F a text message, asking questions regarding smoking methods. In addition to his suggestions via text and reading on the DMT Nexus website, I felt I was ill-equipped to correctly smoke it, much less on my own. All I had was a shitty weed pipe I bought from a gas station and a Bic lighter. I had no weed, no herb or any type of plant material to sandwich it, nor did I have any screens. In conversation with F via text, the conversation eventually led to him inviting me over to his home on the coming Saturday night to smoke it. I believe it was either Wednesday or Thursday. The time and work at the office dragged by endlessly leading up to this. Now, I did not realise, until the day of when the plan was to take place, that he lived 45 minutes away from me. Big deal. However, my licence was suspended, so travelling distances like this proved more difficult than thought. I asked F if I could give him gas money and he would pick me up and take me back, which was a ludicrous ask to begin with, as that would be almost three hours of driving for him. He declined, to no surprise. I was committed to going free with this, and I called an Uber to pick me up and take me. I arrived at his house around 7 or 8pm while the sun was setting. His house was a beach house, a less than 5 minute walk from the beach. It was a messy little bungalow with dogs and people coming in and out. I was off put by the level of activity going on and how messy it was. I had no expectation, but I had hoped it would be quiet and just me and him. However, this was not the case. I was nervous and jittery, yet F could not be bothered. He was high, smoking dabs back to back and eating a salad. He was in no rush to help me enter hyperspace. I sat on his dirty couch, anxiously fiddling and asking pointless questions about the DMT smoking, many of which I already knew the answer to. When F was finally ready, he sat down beside me and laid a massive weed pipe on the coffee table in front of us. He explained we were going to sandwich it by putting a screen in the bottom of the bowl and putting layers of weed and cigarette ash and DMT. What I did not know, or pay attention to, was how much DMT was going to be put into the pipe. In retrospect, with how much research and reading I did regarding the activity, one might think I would have questioned the amount F put into the bowl. I was so nervous and anxious to just do it, that I didn't. Not even once. By the time it was time to finally smoke it, just about half of the one gram bag was inside the bowl, layered between weed and cigarette ash. Before lighting all the goodies up, F stood up and walked over to his stereo. He turned on Divine Moments of Truth by Spongle. I had never heard of Spongle, but after tonight, they would have a lifelong fan. It was turned on full blast, and it made me even more nervous. He sat back down and handed me the pipe. I put it to my lips and I started to hover the flame over the bowl. I could see the DMT begin to vaporise and almost melt. I exhaled all of the air in my lungs and began to inhale slowly and deeply. He stopped lighting and I held it in for about 20 to 30 seconds. When I exhaled, I already began to panic. He said, Don't panic, take another hit. It was as if all of the air had been sucked out of the room. In F's house, the ceiling was plank wood, and the cracks in the wood began to take on life forms of their own. His dog was sitting directly in front of me, staring into my eyes intently, as if he was there to enjoy the show. Everything jumped into a visceral clarity I had never experienced before, not even with high-dose liquid LSD taken intravenously that I had experimented with a couple months before this trip. All of this happens within a couple seconds before the second hit. I begin taking my next hit and hold for about another 10 to 20 seconds. I held it in for less time as the fear began to take hold and I began shaking and my heart was beating out of my chest. Third hit. About 10 to 20 second hold again. I am leaving this world. I close my eyes and see highly complex multifaceted geometry and mandala like visions. I open my eyes and the patterns are laid over every surface in the room. 
F somehow manages to get me to hold the pipe to my lips again, and I take a fourth hit. At this point, I am so overwhelmed and flabbergasted, I do not even clearly recall taking a fourth hit. By F's testimony, I laid back onto the couch without even consciously exhaling. He said most of it just blew out of my nose while I laid there with my head tilted back against the couch, and my eyes completely closed, motionless. I should preface this by saying, I continued tripping for another 40 minutes approximately after the fourth hit. This is by F's account, and I have no reason to believe otherwise, nor is there any way to confirm or deny. After the fourth hit, I don't exist anymore. Nothing ever did. This was always the state of affairs. The best way I could describe this state would be computer consciousness, if that makes sense. No time, no space, no context. Just sounds of blips and bloops, and highly complex geometrical and impossible non-Euclidean shapes. I am moving at light speed, yet completely still. There is no train of thought, or at least for this point of the trip. There are no concepts either. There is no self to assign meaning to anything that was seen. I would describe this possibly as the state of enlightenment or nirvana, as described by Buddhists and Taoists. Everything is nothing. Nothing is everything. I am nowhere and everywhere, and everything and nothing simultaneously. I have become a quark among billions of trillions of other quarks in the universe, completely alone, yet a part of a massive machine with no end or beginning. This state of oneness and ultimate reality goes on for eternity. Probably ten minutes in Earth time, though. As I come out of this state, by no means coming down yet, I am inside a world of tumbling blocks. Highly contrasted blocks of yellows and greens tumbling around in a pattern that hurts my brain to think about. All of the edges of these blocks are soft and round. There is something extremely significant about this part. This tumbling block world is followed by rapid fire imagery. Then, the scene changes. I see an endless desert, a tree on fire, an underground magenta circuit board city. This state of rapid fire imagery goes on for another few minutes, or so I imagine. During this state, some small sliver of self begins to resurface. I find myself recognising the impossible images as they flash, trying to say what they are. I imagine F just heard me muttering gibberish in a slightly excited manner. It's like deja vu on crack. It's on the tip of my tongue. I am certain I have been here before. At some point, I start to transition to the part of the trip where I begin to return to my body, but with full ego loss and full DMT visuals. I am back in F's living room. The dog is in front of me. As far as I know, it's an alien creature with more than six eyes peering into my soul. F is there, and he looks like himself as I knew him. But I was still tripping so hard. I couldn't really remember who he was, or where I was for that matter. Also, my vision is only black and white. I became caught in a loop. I don't even recognise during the loop that I am in a loop. There was only ever that moment. There is no past or present. So, there I am. Whatever I am. I had no conception of what a human is. In F's living room with his dog. Stuck in a loop. I think I am dead. I am dead. The loop goes like this. I look at F and try to speak. He laughs. He says something completely incomprehensible. And I look at his dog. I look at his dog. Look around the room. Which mostly looks like a melting black and white mess of cartoonish soup. And then I look back at F. I try to speak and the words come out like, or something like this. He says something in an alien language, and then I look back at the dog. This loop goes on for eternity. It is not particularly unpleasant, as at this stage I have no context for anything, pleasant or unpleasant. It just is, and it's always been like this. I imagine this part went on for about 7 to 10 minutes in Earth time. Now we get to the final stage of the trip. 
what I imagine as the final 10 to 15 minutes of the around 40 minute trip total. At some point I start to come out of the loop. Upon exiting the loop, colour returns to my vision. I am also able to stand and semi walk around and move my limbs. I find myself trying to have conversations with F, but not in a loop. They are completely non-English, but I believe I am trying to figure out what is going on and exactly what is happening and what happened to my brain. F finds this particularly funny, as I can remember attempting to communicate with him and he just stood there with a 1000 tooth monstrous grin, laughing hysterically. I don't believe it was in a mean way, more in a, <laughs> I've been there before sort of way. But either way, I am in a house I don't recognise, with a hippie that I can't place, in a body I didn't understand. Somehow, this transitions to me and F walking outside. There is a thick rainbow gas in the air, like walking through a rainbow fog. The trees, grass, everything is alive and communicating with me. F has the alien dog on a green rope that is also alive, and we begin walking. Well, F is walking, and I am barely walking. I was in complete awe of nature, stumbling around alongside him. We walk down the street for a few minutes, and things are generally okay, considering my extreme hallucinogenic state. We got to a cross street, and things take a very bad turn in the trip. I'm standing next to F, and he says something to me. Suddenly, tripping me begins to believe a dangerous paranoid theory. The theory is that F and his alien dog have kidnapped my ass somehow, and that I'm now in hell. I can't leave, and this will never end. Keep in mind, I still can't remember my own name, or much less who F even is. Of course, upon this realisation, the only logical option is to punch F in the face to escape this nightmare. This is where things get tricky. In my trip, one version of events happen, that don't actually happen of course. And then of course, what actually did happen. I'll tell the tripping version first. I punch F in the face with all of my might. I connect, laying him flat on the ground. My fist is covered in glossy, vibrant red blood, and F is out cold. I kneel down on the ground and see a strange aura around his body. Also, near his head and face, I see teeth. At first, it's just a few of what I imagined would be, of course, his teeth. It's not just a little bit of chipped tooth, they are full teeth, as if they were extracted in a dental procedure. Now, the teeth begin to multiply. I stand up from my kneeling position, and I look at the pavement around me. There are hundreds of bloody teeth everywhere. They're everywhere, I can see them on the pavement. As I step back, I hear and feel my shoes crunching on them. Then, I begin to hear the voices. Did you see that? He killed him. Shadowy neighbour figures are standing outside of the neighbouring houses. I don't see actual people there, they are more like silhouettes. But the voices I hear are very real. Then, I begin to see red and blue lights coming from around the corner. Pure panic, like I've never felt before, begins to set in. This is it. I'm going to prison for murder. Despite how hard I was tripping, it's odd. I didn't even know I was tripping. That's how hard I was tripping. But I knew that cops and prison were a thing that was coming. I took off running as fast as I could. I'm not proud of my response, as I really hope if I actually killed someone that I would not run, but I would stay and face the consequences of my actions. Anyway, I'm running as fast as I can, and I take off my shirt. It begins pouring with rain. It is night time at this point, and I still have no memory of where I am. This part of the trip is easily the most scared I have ever been in my 19 years of life so far. I'm not sure if the fear and panic I experienced here has been topped as of yet. I'm shirtless, blind tripping, running from imaginary cops down the street. I run and run, until I cannot run anymore. I come upon another neighbourhood, a gated one. I run up to the little gate box where the gate person that communicates to the cars entering the community sits. She is a middle-aged white woman, wearing a lot of red lipstick. She is immediately off-put by the soaking wet, six-foot-three skinny young adult with massive eyeballs walking up to her. 
She holds her ground, and I say to her, I need help. I'm afraid I've lost my mind. Can you call an ambulance and have them take me to a mental hospital, please? This is what I actually said. She says, No, I can't do that. You have to go somewhere else. Please, please, I need help, I beg her. I do not know who I am or where I am. I've lost my mind. I'm very sorry. I cannot help you, young man, she says. I walk off in the direction I came from, completely and utterly defeated. I continue walking aimlessly. My faculties, however, slowly begin to return to me as I walk. I get an idea, maybe, that I have something with me so I can figure out who I am and what's going on. Maybe I have something in my pockets, a clue to point me in the right direction, out of this hell. I check my back pockets first, empty. I check my front pockets and there's only one thing in my left pocket, a bag with half a gram of DMT in it. The greatest feeling of relief washed over me. I realised I'm on DMT right now. I finally remembered that I smoked DMT earlier tonight. I begin laughing. The best laugh I've ever laughed. I realised I was probably imagining certain things that may not be true. I still believed I either killed or seriously injured a man earlier, however. With my head starting to get into a semi-sober place, I continued walking the way I ran away from the murder. That's when I see F's house. I run directly into the house to find F with a few of his other friends sitting around. Upon entering the house, they all jump out of the chairs and say, Oh my god, he's back. I look at F and start crying. I run over and hug him and say, I'm so glad you're alive. I thought I'd killed you. He says, What? Killed me? I say, Yes, I punched you in the face. You've just fucking died. Your teeth were everywhere. F and his friends fall out laughing hysterically. M, you didn't even make contact, F explains. You swung the sloppiest, slowest punch I've ever seen. I moved out of the way and you proceeded to freak the fuck out screaming. And then you ran away into the rain out of sight. I had my dog with me and you ran away so fast I found it pointless to chase you. I figured you would come down at some point and come back. I was shocked to hear this, but relieved. After this revelation, we sat on the front porch and smoked a bunch of weed and cigarettes. I cried tears of joy and love. I couldn't believe the experience I had just had, and I couldn't be happier to be back in my body and right mind. Me and F were friends for years after this, and had a few more trips and he was my main supplier of all things psychedelic. We lost contact after I got sober and moved to a different state. I will never forget this night and this trip. After this trip, I awoke to many truths. That life implies death. That self implies other. I began to feel my own existence as absolutely fundamental. We are all the fabric of existence itself. We are all interdependent upon each other. I am you. You are me. We are all each other. Faces of God. Nothing is separate, and there are no separate events. We are all in one continuous moment, experiencing each other, forever. There is no self. Everything is one. These things have been said, and it can almost be a bit cliché to say them. But after that night, I have never found more comfort and truth in the understanding that we are all one, the universe experiencing itself. Some afterthoughts. I really do not know what F was thinking giving anyone that much DMT, much less for their first trip. I had many DMT trips after this, but none as intense and insane as this one was.